All right. So okay. making inferences. Um, basically, inferences are like, um, here's a graphic, I think, in the next page. Um, inferences are basically like what you already know plus anything you, you got from the text. Right. So like you make inferences with movies all the time. So if you're watching a movie and like this weird thing keeps happening or whatever, you're going to start to notice and you're going to try to think, oh, I wonder if something bad is going to happen to this main character. It's basically a guess using the clues from the story plus your own knowledge. Um, inferencing is difficult because it's not just like stated in the text. Um, you have to make a guess at it. Um, right. So yeah. like, here's an example, Maria... Uh, Maria went home after school to play video games and watch TV. She didn't care about studying for her for any exams. On the day of the exam, she had a pit in her stomach. All right, so what inference can you make about Maria and how she will do on the exam? That she probably won't do that good. Exactly. You just made an inference. Okay, so um, it's just taking what you already know. You know that if you don't study for an exam and you, don't, and you just play video games, probably not going to do very well. Um, and then you use the textual clues to make that guess. So Maria probably didn't study and won't do very well. Um, what, and then what else is asked for inferences is giving um, textual clues. So the textual, or it's also called textual evidence. Um, okay. And this is basically like when you're, when you're asked to provide textual evidence, that's basically like in a math class when you're asked to show your work. Like the teacher wants to know, how you found that, how you came to that answer. So uh, textual evidence is usually a direct quote. So some of the next assignments, I think, ask for textual evidence, which means a quote. Okay. So textual clues, um, she spent her time playing. So this is a quote, playing video <laughs> games and watching TV, taken okay. from the text. Um, and didn't care about setting. So care was also a quote. So it was taken directly from this. So when they're asked okay. for textual clues or textual evidence, you can copy and paste it, but you have to put quotes around it. Okay. okay. All right, so that's inferencing. Let's see if there's anything cool. Or is this the last? Am I on the last one? Um, I think it says four pages. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay, so then the next... The next lesson is about connotation, denotation, and tone. Um, one of the ways your brain makes connections is if you um, figure out what you already know about the topic. Have you ever heard, these are tricky words, have you ever heard connotation, denotation, or tone? No, I have not. Okay. Hey, Shirley. Um, Maria here, your teacher. We were going to be doing um, Romeo and Juliet from English 11, but... Um, Jessica was here and she had questions for English nine. So we, we moved to English nine. Um, Shirley, are you in English 11? Um, no, I'm actually still trying to, um, finish up English 10. You're in English 10, aren't you? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to go through these couple lessons with Jessica here and then maybe you can either um, stop by in like 15 minutes or you can hang on whatever you want to do um, and then we could we could go through some of the lessons in English 10 does that sound like a plan and um, that sounds fine with me perfect okay so yeah like I said you can just hang out here if you want or just drop in in like 15 minutes or something but some of these some of these lessons too surely might come up in English 10 so some of the same terms so whatever you want to do all right, so connotation, denotation, and tone. Um, Jessica, I had asked if you had heard those before. Have you heard of them? Heard no, of them? I haven't. Okay, cool. So I have some easy ways to help memorize or remember what these terms mean. Um, but basically, and also we're talking about making a word prediction. So if you're going to make a prediction for a word, you want to have prior knowledge. So basically have something that you know about it already and then use context clues, um, and then you'll be able to make a word prediction. Okay. <clears throat> um, so like we talked about in the last lesson, inferencing, making a word prediction is kind of the same way. You're gonna use the clues from the text and then use what you already know. 
So here's an example of a word. The dog and the owner walked briskly to the park. How would you predict the word, the meaning of the word briskly? Um, um, quick. Yeah, yeah. So do you know what the word brisk means? No, I do not. Cool. So if you knew what the word brisk means, you might have a better idea of it too. But you're right. It is. It does mean quickly. <clears throat> um, I know that like when you're walking with a dog, usually the dog's pulling the leash, right? Yeah. And so people are walking quickly. Um, also, the dog might be excited to go to the park. Um, right. And so that's kind of how, where I kind of came up with um, how brisk, what briskly might mean, just using the clues. So it says, you know, personally, the dogs usually walk quickly, especially if no. Okay, this is exactly what I said. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Um, next one. How about this one? He felt compelled to eat the cake after not eating any lunch. Compelled to eat the cake after not eating any lunch. What do you think compelled means? Um, like he had to? Yeah, why? What were, what were the clues there? Um, that he felt, um, I don't know, to eat it. Yeah. Um, yeah, to eat it. Okay, he's eating it. Um, also, because it says eat, um, not eating any lunch. Right. Okay. Like I, I know if I didn't eat any lunch, I would definitely want to eat a piece of cake. <laughs> right. I'd want to eat a piece of cake anyways, but um, especially if I hadn't eaten lunch. So there's your textual clues. Um, so it says, you know that not eating lunch makes you hungry because of the clue in the text, not eating any lunch and your own knowledge that cake tastes good. Uh, you would guess that compelled means to be persuaded or forced. And you said, you said wanted to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then that's correct. Yep. So good job. Okay. You can also make word productions based on connotation. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to show you this video. You can watch that's it fine. on your own time if you want to, but that's basically fine. connotation um, is like the feeling of the word. So for example, let me see if there's an examples in these ones. Give him one, Lydia. Let's see. Okay. So, so denotation is the dictionary definition of the word. So the, the way I remember connotation and denotation is denotation D for dictionary D for definition. Okay. And then connotation, the opposite, no more, of, that, the opposite yeah. of that is like the emotion um, that goes into it. So I'm wondering if they'll, if we have examples, otherwise I might. Okay, there's no example, so I'll talk about it. So for example, um, here's, here's an example of connotation. So if I said you were smart versus you were a know-it-all, okay. which, one, which one of those feels better, smart or know-it-all? Smart. Right, smart has a positive connotation. Um, here's another one. Um, um, skinny or frail? Like, which one has a po positive connotation? Skinny. Skinny. Okay, how about um, fit or, I'm trying to think, fit or, no, I can't think of anyone with that one. But basically, oh, um, eh. So basically they're, they're synonyms, they're words that mean very similar. They're very similar to each other, but one has a more positive connotation or negative connotation. Okay. So connotation is like the emotion, the feeling behind the word. So even though the dictionary definition, you know, for smart, um, you know, means intelligent and know-it-all pretty much means intelligent too, there's different emotions behind it. So the way that Connotation deno and denotation are related to tone. Um, this term tone um, is that if you obviously are using positive connotation words throughout your writing, the tone is going to be positive. So the tone of a piece is um, the attitude the author has towards the topic. Right. Um, yeah, I know what tone means. Oh, perfect. Awesome. 
great. Yeah, okay. I write, yeah, I write poetry, so I know what tone means. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I wish we had assignments where um, where you'd be able to write some poetry, but um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time for it. But if you want to send me an ear poetry, go for it. That'd be great. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. So, okay, so this is activity one to one, so we could do it together. Um, dictionary definition is denotation, connotation, tone, or author's purpose. Detonation. Yep. So that's A, the attitude the author takes towards the subject. Uh, tone. You got it. Yep. The emotional value of a, wor of a word. Connotation, uh, con connotation. Yep, connotation. And the author's purpose, we skipped over that, but that is what the author is trying to accomplish. So that'd be D. Check answers. Woo! 10 out of 10. All right, super. Um, I think the next one is that we have to write a, read a story. So uh, we can skip that. Oh, okay. So this is, um, we'll go through this. This is, this is just good practice. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of a plot diagram before, but um, the plot is organized into a couple different sections. So you start with, I wish I had a visual here, the video. You know what, for time's sake, you um, go through lesson one, three and watch the video and do that assignment, okay? Okay, I will. Um, all right, so here's the link to the story landlady, which we'll be reading. I'm trying to think. If, I think we might be able to, I think I might be able to read this aloud to you. Hmm. All right, that would have really helped me a lot. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, let's, let's do that, and then we can do the activity. The only thing is I'm going to have to kind of read quickly. That's fine. Um, to meet the thing, but then we That's can fine. kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, okay. All right, so. Before you get started, um, have you ever have you heard of Roald Dahl, the author? No, I have not. Okay, so Roald Dahl is um, he wrote Matilda, um, oh. the BFG. Matilda was a movie too. Um, yeah. What else did he write? Um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Did he really? Yep. So he he's a really famous like short story author, but also like he wrote children's like chapter books. But some common themes are that his he's funny. Like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is funny, but it's also kind of creepy, right? You're like, um, all right, something just ain't right about this person. Um, so mm -hmm. knowing that we know a little bit about the author already. So just be aware that his characters are usually unique and also, yeah. I'll just say, I'll just say for the lack of better term, we'll just call it unique for right now, but okay. keep your guard up. The, the characters okay. are interesting. Okay. All right, so here we go. Uh, Billy Weaver had traveled down from London on the slow afternoon train with a change of Swindon on the way, and by the time he got to Bath, it was about 9 o'clock in the evening, and the moon was coming up out of the clear starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. All right, so already we know he's in London, and Bath must be a town close to London, so he is not in the United States. So there's the setting for us. But the air was deadly cold and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. Excuse me, he said, but is there a fairly cheap hotel not too far away from here? Try the Bell and Dragon, the porter answered, pointing down the road. They might take you in. It's about a quarter of a mile along the other side. Billy thanked him and picked up his suitcase and set out to walk the quarter mile to the Bell and Dragon. He had never been to Bath before. He didn't know anyone who lived there, but Mr. Greenslid at the head office in London had told him it was a splendid city. Find your own lodgings, he had said, and then go along and report to the branch manager as soon as you've got yourself settled. Billy was 17 years old. He was wearing a new navy blue overcoat, a new brown trilby hat, and the new brown suit, and he was feeling fine. He walked briskly, and we already know what that word means, quickly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly these days. Briskness, he had decided, was the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen. The big shots up at head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. They were amazing. All right, so for lack of um, more time, I'm going to make some assumptions about the main character. So he's he's 17 years old. Hey, Brandy. Um, Brandy, if you want to unmute yourself and let us know, um, are you in English 11? 
with Romeo and Juliet? I think you were in you were in the session last week, so I don't think you're in English 11. Um, we're currently working on English 9, semester 1. Um, and then in about 10, 15 more minutes, we will be working on English 10 with um, a student that's going to chime back in. So you can, um, we're reading The Landlady. Uh, it's a story you're supposed to read in English 9. So feel free to follow along or jump back in um, when we scoot over to English 10. Thanks for joining. All right, so the, the main character, Billy, he's 17 years old and it looks like he's working kind of like for a business. Um, and so that's what we know about him. There were no shops in the wide street that he was walking along, only a line of tall houses on each side, all of them identical. They had porches and pillars and four or five steps going up to their front doors. And it was obvious that once upon a time they had been very swanky residences. But now even in the darkness, he could see that the paint was peeling from the woodwork on their doors and windows and that the handsome, white facades were cracked and blotchy from neglect. Suddenly in a downstairs window that was brilliantly illuminated by a street lamp not six yards away, Billy caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass in one of the upper panes. It said bed and breakfast. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthem chrysanthemums, tall and beautiful, standing just underneath the notice. He stopped walking. He made it a bit closer. Green curtains, some sort of velvety material, were hanging. Um, let me check who's just came in. Hey, Lulu, um, we are currently working on English 9, semester 1, um, but in about 10 minutes, we're going to be jumping over to English 10. If you were chiming in um, to hear about Romeo and Juliet, we kind of sidestepped because nobody was in the class from an English 11. Um, so just let me know. I might be able to answer your questions um, at the end after I'm done with English 9 and English 10. And... Um, or else you can just hang out and listen to English 9. Um, we're reading The Landlady um, and kind of uh, reading for comprehension right now. So, thanks. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, let's see. Chrysanthemum, chrysanth chrysanthemums looked wonderful beside them. He went right up and peered through the glass into the room. And the first thing he saw was a bright fire burning in the hearth. On the carpet in the front fire, a pretty little Datsun was curled up asleep with its nose tucked in its belly. Um, hey, Mo, we are um, we are doing English 9 right now because nobody was in the class from English 11. So we're reading the landlady to comprehend. And then in about five, 10, 15 more minutes, we are going to jump over to English 10 for a few questions that another student had. Um, feel free to hang out and learn from this. Or um, if it doesn't, if you don't find it relevant, um, you can always come back next week too. So... On the other hand, a pub would be more congenial than a boarding. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. So he's peering into this bed and breakfast, um, Jessica, and he's noticing some things. So he said the room itself so far, as he could see in the half darkness, was filled with pleasant furniture. There was a baby grand piano and a big sofa and several plump armchairs. And in one corner, he spotted a large parrot in a cage. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this, Billy told himself. And all in all, it looked to him as though it would be a pretty decent house to stay in. Certainly, it would be more comfortable than, than the Bell and Dragon. On the other hand, a pub would be more congenial than a boarding house. There would be beer and darts in the evenings, and lots of people to talk to. Oh, hey, who just, hey, Shaquetta. Um, if you can unmute yourself or um, type in the chat box if you're in English 11. Um, we started the class and uh, nobody was in, in English 11, so we're doing English 9 right now. Uh, if you happen to be in English 9, we are reading The Landlady together. Um, and then in a moment, we will be um, moving over to English 10 for a student that had a question about English 10. So feel free to hang out. You might learn something. Um, but like I said, if it doesn't seem relevant to what you're working on, um, come back Come back next week too. So, all right. Um, all right. So basically, Jessica, he um, he's thinking in his head about staying at a pub, which just meant like, it would be like a hotel above a pub. Um, right. And he's describing that. And I'm going to skip that paragraph because it's not that interesting. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say it's not that interesting. <laughs> it's not necessary <laughs> for the time. Mm -hmm. All right. After right. dithering about like this, and dithering is like a, a English term that we probably wouldn't, like like Brit, a British term that we don't usually use. Um, but that means just kind of like lingering about Okay. After dithering about like this in the cold for two or three minutes, Billy decided that he would walk 
on and take a look at the bell and dragon before making up his mind. He turned to go and now a queer thing happened to him. He was in the act of stepping back and turning away from the window when all at once his eyes, his eye was caught and held in the most peculiar, peculiar manner by the small notice that was there. Bed and breakfast, it said. Bed and breakfast. I am trying to see. Oh, hey, Shirley. Um, we're going to finish up here and then we'll get to English 10. Each word was like a huge black eye staring at him through the glass, holding him, compelling him, forcing him to stay where he was and not to walk away from the house. And the next thing he knew, he was actually moving across from the window to the front door of the house, climbing the steps that led up to it and reaching for the bell. All right, so he basically sees this sign that says bed and breakfast, and then it repeats it, repeats it. And then it says a large black eye was staring at him through the glass, holding him. Um, it says that the word was like a large black eye. Um, so that's kind of like a suggestion that things are weird. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I just check the chat box here. Oh, Shaquetta, English 12. Okay, cool. Um, we might have time for that. Um, you can hang hang in for a bit and see if I can answer at the end of the class. We will be, I can't see the time right now, but we will be done at, in an hour. Um, so uh, totally up to you. All right, staring at him. All right, he pressed the bell far away in the back room. He heard it ringing and then at once, it must've been at once because he hadn't even had time to take his finger from the bell button. The door swung open and a woman was standing there. All right, so also creepy. He went to ring the doorbell and before, oh yeah, he rang it once and the door opened like immediately. Normally you ring the bell and you have at least a half minute's wait before the door opens, but this dame was like a jack in the box. He pressed the bell and out she popped. It made him jump. She was about 45 or 50 years old and the moment she saw him, she gave him a warm, welcoming smile. Please come in, she said pleasantly. She stepped aside, holding the door wide open, and Billy found himself automatically sta starting forward into the house. The compulsion, or more accurately, the desire to follow after her into that house was extraordinarily strong. Okay, also kind of creepy. Like, why do you feel compelled to go inside a stranger's home? I saw the notice in the window, he said, holding himself back. Yes, I know. I was wondering about a room. It's all ready for you, my dear, she said. She had a round pink face and very gentle blue eyes. I was on my way to the Bell and Dragon, Billy told her, but the notice in the, your window just happened to catch my eye. My dear boy, she said, why don't you come in out of the cold? How much do you charge? Five and six pence a night. Obviously a, a British term there. Uh, including breakfast. It was fantastically cheap. It was less than half of what he had been willing to pay. If that is too much, she added, then perhaps I can reduce it just a tiny bit. Do you desire an egg for breakfast? Eggs are expensive at the moment. It would be six pence less without the egg. Five and six pence is fine, he answered. I should like very much to stay here. I knew you would. Do come in. She smiled terribly nice. She looked exactly like the mother of one of his best school friends, welcoming one of the house to stay for Christmas holidays. Billy took off his hat and stepped over the threshold. Just hang it there, she said, and let, it, let me help you with your coat. There were no other hats or coats in the hall. So also weird. There were no umbrellas, no walking sticks, nothing. We have it all to ourselves, she said, smiling at him over her shoulder as she led the way upstairs. You see, it's very often I have the pleasure of taking a visitor into my little nest. The old girl is slightly dotty. Dotty meaning uh, scatterbrained, maybe? Billy told himself, but at five and six pence a night, who gives a damn about that? I should have thought you'd be simply swamped with applicants, she said politely. Oh, I am, dear. I am. Of course I am. But the trouble is that I'm inclined to be just a teeny weeny bit choosy in particular, if you see what I mean. Ah, uh, yes. But I'm always ready. Everything's always ready day and night in this house, just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman will come along. Kind of creepy. And it is such a pleasure, my dear. It's such a very great pleasure when now and again I open the door and I see someone standing there who is just exactly right. She was halfway up the stairs and she paused with one hand on the stair rail, turning ahead and smiling down at him with pale lips. Like you, she added. And her blue eyes traveled slowly all the way down the length of Billy's body to his feet and then up again. Creepy. On the first floor landing, she said to him, this floor is mine. They climbed up a second flight and this one is all yours, she said. Here's your room. All right. Um, due to time, Jessica, I won't be able yep, to finish. Time. We were on page. Uh, I can't remember what page we're on. Oh, right here. Uh, but anyway, so... Keep in mind that the questions are gonna ask you about making inferences. So it's probably gonna ask for textual evidence about um, like when you first noticed something was wrong about the bed and breakfast. Um, and so textual evidence will be in a quote. Um, it might ask you, I'm trying to think of what are the other questions they ask. Um, 
definitely will ask about making inferences. Oh, it might ask you about the tone um, right. of the story. So like, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of got like a creepy tone. Um, something's just not right. Like something's a little bit off. Um, yeah. It's going to yeah. ask you about the connotations that the landlady uses. So the, the way the lady speaks to Billy is very pleasant. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, okay, um, she, something seems wrong with her. So why would she be acting so pleasant to Billy? So um, anyway, so those are the questions that you could probably see um, okay. after you finish reading that. So I hope I got you a good start on it. Yes, uh, but yeah, you. I want to, I want to answer Shirley's questions. That's, that's so. fine. That's cool. Fine. Thank you very much. Yep. You're welcome. All right, Shirley. Um, what, uh, what assignments are you currently on? Are you on English 10 semester one or two? The semester one. <clears throat> cool. Um, and which unit are you on? Um, I want to say it's five because I'm pretty close to being done. Okay. Um, types of figure activity I'm having problems with right now is the 7.4.1. 7.4.1. Okay. Yeah. Two the paragraph. Two paragraph argument draft. Yeah. yeah. That's a doozy. Um, I'll take full blame for that. I, I wrote this course um, and that one is the one that is the most confusing for students um, to complete. So we can, we can go through there. It's part, like I said, partly for me to blame because um, it's hard for students to understand where they're supposed to get concrete details from and such. So, all right, so let's start with seven, four. Okay. Um, all right, so you're going, you know what your task is. You're going to write two persuasive paragraphs that identify a claim and counterclaim. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is to convince um, people of your opinion and your audience will be somebody that might not agree with you. So you're trying to persuade people that think differently from you. You are using this format, but remember that you were writing about uh, President Trump's executive order. So it was like, it was those videos. Yeah. Okay, so that's the topic that you're writing about. Some students get confused about like if they're supposed to choose a topic. Um, so you're writing about the executive order and all of that stuff can be found in the previous um, lessons. Which ones was it? Um, It might be this one. Yeah, seven one. Um, so you wanna watch this video. He's on one side of it. And then you wanna watch the next video, which is on the other side of it. Um, and you'll be, and did you watch those videos? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you wanna choose your side, whichever side you wanna be on, doesn't matter. Um, and then we'll go through this format. So if you chose, let's just, let's just use your opinion so that we can stay on the same track. What do you, do you support president Trump's executive order or not? No, I don't. Okay. So I, you would say, I don't, that would be your top sentence. I don't support president Trump's executive order, blah, 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 blah. Um, then you'd have a con you'd have two concrete details to support that. So you could, Technically, you can use the video, so you could write down things exactly taken from the video, and just you could just cite it by saying like first video, um, or like whoever the author was. So if it was, you would be probably using the George. I can't. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Takai, maybe um, his video. So some things that would support. Takai is how his last name is said. Thank you, Takai. Um, so the, um, so things that he said, so he compared it to, I'm just going off memory cause I, um, I haven't gone through this recently, but the things that he said were basically that this, the travel ban was similar to the, um, Japanese American, um, internment camps. Right. So yeah, that could be a concrete detail. Um, what is the other thing that he said? Um, Basically, that you can't just you can't just um, 
cut people out based on a religion. I think he said that too. Yeah. Um, so you'd want to go back and kind of like watch the video and get maybe a quote that he said. And then, so those would be two facts taken from that. Then you would put your own opinion. So you'd say like, I agree with that because, um, you know, learning about the Japanese internment camps, uh, you know, that's ethically wrong or whatever your opinion will be on that. Yes. And then you'd have a concluding sentence. So you just kind of restate, I don't support it because blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, then this is the tricky part, the counterclaim. So mm -hmm. you're still supporting your own opinion, but you're, you're addressing what somebody would say against you. So okay. I would, I would say the biggest argument against this would be um, like, okay, cool, but there's terrorists out in the world. So we're going to let all the terrorists in. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like that would be the counterclaim to that. So right. you would want to say, um, you know, I realize that, you know, there terrorists, terrorism exists in this world. However, See, I had this same argument with my husband just the other night. Did you? <laughs> oh, yes, I did. Because I told him, I said, look at Timothy McVeigh. He wasn't Muslim. Yeah, yeah. That's Hey, that's perfect. That's perfect. Like, Reason for counterclaim. <laughs> yep, so you would write that. Um, that's perfect. Yep, so people would say, well, okay, so you're just supposed to let all the bad guys in, right? Or bad gals, too. Um, and so you would say look, we've had terrorists that are in the United States as well. So, so the re so basically you're just addressing what people would say against your opinion, right? Okay. So it's not, you're still supporting your initial opinion, but you're addressing right. what people would say to you. Right. Uh, so you'd say, yeah, so I realize there's terrorists, but there's also terrorists inside of the United States, like Timothy, you would, then your rebuttal, um, or um, so you'd say that, and then you'd give examples. So like, like Timothy McVeigh or like something, something, something that's happened. Or you could even say like, like the school shootings that are happening that might right. also support right. it because that's happened within the United States. Right. Um, and then you'd restate, you'd say something like, um, obviously terrorism exists in the world and we shouldn't be inviting people, you know, that could, you know, prove to be violent. However, right. Even inside the United States, we've had problems, not just, yeah. Right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to open it up to, anyway, I still, we, I still see we have, um, we have some other people in, in the class. So if anybody, I answered Shirley's question, does anybody else have a question they want me to ask or want me to answer? <laughs> And you can unmute yourself um, to ask your question. Yes, I need to help with English 12. Hey, okay. Is this, is this? Um, Shaquita. Hey, Shaquita. Okay, so English 12, what? Um, semester one. English 12, semester one. Okay, cool. Okay, which um, which unit are you in? Um, I want to say three. Okay. No, Tragic Hero. Tragic Hero. Oh, it's a good one. Okay. Um, all right. So this one is really, really from memory. So um, have you started on unit two or should we just go maybe through the lesson? We can go through the lesson. I started the lesson but I was getting real confused. Okay, cool. Yeah, maybe it'll just help if I can like explain it a little bit differently. So, all right, so you're reading The Crucible um, and The Crucible is a tragedy. Uh, and then it says, oh, six aspects of tragedy, review, try. Okay, cool. Okay, this has a video, which, have you watched the video? Yes. Wait, okay. nope. I did this one. So we are on. I'm oh, on the next one. Lesson two, two. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can help you out. All right. Find the traits of a tragic hero. Let's see if anybody else show. 
All right, so do, 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 do. let's go to the next page and do the Prezi. They pretty much are videos. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one's a Prezi, um, so you kind of have to click through this one, but um, let's see here. All right, so a tragic hero has like several different like cycles or you would say like commonalities. Right. Um, so the definition is a no, somebody who is good. Um, but something bad happens. So like something that's kind of good, but something bad happens. Um, has some type of tragic flaw. So who, have you been reading The Crucible? From what they have given me so far. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yep, you're right. Um, so there is a I character. I don't understand how they talk either. Oh, how, how the Crucible, how to read The Crucible? Yes. Like the, yeah. Um, you might want, um, let's see. That's the context. That's not it. Um, have you done activity 221? Yes. OK. Oh, you've done it. Um, you said two, two, one. Yeah. This was basically like taking the Prezi and then answering the questions. We can walk through it right now if you want. Okay. All right. So it says, what are the characteristics of a tragic, of a tragic hero? Um, it says, mark all that apply. Um, I'm just going to see who just showed up here. Hey, Matt both mats. Um, we're doing English 12 right now because nobody was in English 11 when we started the class. So you can just follow along if you want. Um, and then I'm trying to figure out what we have about 20 more minutes left of class. So um, there might be some time for like questions. I'm going to try to mute everyone. in some I will have background. OK, um, all right, Shaquetta, so let's do these one. What are the characteristics of a tragic hero? Uh, noble, but not perfect due to the flaw, has a happily ever after, increase in self-awareness during the journey, helping the reader feel pity and fear for the, for the hero. Any ideas? I might have muted you, Shaquetta. Sorry. Um, noble, but not perfect due to Yeah. Yep, and, that's right. And self-awareness. Yep. Good job. All right, put the items in in the correct order. Um, I didn't go through this, so I'm going to go through um, from memory, but I might have to reference the Prezi here. So let me... All right, tragic hero must experience a change or recognition. She must gain self-knowledge, okay? Or story is sad, but does not leave audience depressed. Tragedy is meant to ne negatively excite and upset the audience. Generally, the punishment is greater than the crime. Downfall is partially his or her own fault. Noble but not perfect hero is flawed. Oh, that's the one I had trouble with. Yeah, this one's hard because um, I can understand why you would have trouble with that because it doesn't look like it needs to be ordered. Um, let me look here. What was it? English 221. We'll look at the Prezi.
All right, let's see if this one shows us the... All right, these don't show us. Oh, here it is. All right, so tragic hero cycle. Number one, tragic hero is a character of noble stature. Uh, that one's not really listed. Tragic hero is great, not perfect. Perhaps elevated to a higher position in society. Aha, that's number one. Noble but not perfect because it's listed here as number two. Uh, number three, the hero's downfall is partially his or her own fault. Okay, that must be number two. Downfall, partially his or her own fault. The hero's misfortune is not wholly deserved. The punishment does not often meet the crime. That must be number three. The hero's fall is not... The hero's fall is not pure loss. There is some increase in awareness. I recognize that. Uh, maybe. Oh, this should be three. Uh, let's read that again. The hero's fall is not pure loss. Awareness, some gain, self-knowledge, self-discovery. All right, so I think this must be four. This must be five. All right, so you see what I did there? It asked questions to order it, and then I just went back to the Prezi, read through it. Okay. Did you have enough time to write it down, or do you want me to look? No, I wrote it down. Cool. All right, what are other common characteristics of a tragic hero? Um. Let's see. Let's look, because I think there was something that said characteristics. Okay. Ah, noble, tragic flaw, increased self-awareness, audience feels pity. Um, so that would have to be downfall due to excessive pride. Yeah, that might work. Usually never. a leader. Usually a leader, never is the protagonist. Yeah, uh, and doom from start. Hero suffering has meaning for the audience. No, I don't know about that. That yes, one we might. Yes. This one might be tricky. I don't know if we yes, got hero. Hero. This one. Yeah. All right. A tragic hero is a person of noble birth or character who has greatness. Greatness, but is destroyed due to a flaw. Flaw. Check answers. Hey, we got them all right. Woohoo. Okay. Perfect. All right. So let's go to this next one because this one's tricky. Graphic organizer. Okay. So in the crucible. Um, understanding the character of John Proctor is the heart of the story. It will be very important to understand the journey he goes through as the story unfolds. In fact, once you finish reading the crucible, you'll be writing a literary analysis essay on John Proctor. Uh, please watch the video to learn more about character. We're going to skip that for right now. Uh, we skip that right now to see if we can get to. Uh, direct characterization. We're going to skip that for a second. Okay, you have to find direct quotes. Okay, um, have you watched this video yet? Yeah. Okay, so basically it's like little mini, it's gonna ask you to find quotes um, supporting, supporting evidence that John Proctor is a tragic hero. So I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna talk you through this. Um, and hopefully you'll have a better understanding of it. All right, so on the left here is like 
an element of a tragic hero. So basically what we talked about in that Prezi, like that they're noble, that they have a flaw, um, that they have heightened self-awareness, um, they had to have some type of suffering. Uh, that's the element here. And then there's some guiding questions uh, to help you. Now on the right is where you would provide textual evidence. So this is where you would have to go back into the crucible and find a quote or evidence of this tragic hero element. So if I was about to do this, and this, is, this whole thing is not due. In fact, it's not graded at where you are right now in the course. But okay. the reason, the reason, but you still have to do it because I'll tell you why. If you do this in like mini sections, so I can't remember what you've already, I don't can't remember what you've already done. Um, but like if we've already talked about, if we could already answer this question now, it'll help you because then in the next section, you'll answer this question. And the next section that you read, you answer this question. And the next section, you answer this question. And then by the end, you'll basically have your outline for your um, essay ready to go. So if you follow along, even though it's not graded right now, your essay will be pretty much um, done. Yeah, like outlined and you'll have all of your evidence for it. All right, so it says, what characteristics make John a good person? Is he a leader? Does he know right from wrong? How does he act? All right, so this requires you to remember something about the crucible. Um, John, Pro do you remember anything about the character John Proctor? He was somehow a leader. Okay, so if you could, I'll just write this on here. He was, oops. Oh, I can't, I forgot, because I'm in labor. Um, so he was a leader. So basically, if you remember, that he's a leader. Um, where are characters in the Crucible Act One? Where is where is the text <laughs> for the Crucible? Where do they link it? Not here. Not here. How do you work that? Which one? Or what? That activity thing when you gotta move it. Oh, was it the Prezi? Yes. Um, yeah, so you just click in there. So sometimes if it's a Prezi, um, you can click, you click through it. If it's a, just a YouTube video, it'll just play. Okay, so. All right, the text isn't here because they're giving you, because the, the play is so long. Um, so basically what you'd have to do in this organizer, and because of time, we're just gonna have to go with that. But um, where's my, here it is. Um, so you would say, I can't type in here because it's on a different document, but um, so you would write that maybe that he is a leader and then you'd figure out why or how he is a leader in the community? Like what made you think he was a leader? Do you know? Do you remember? Not really. Okay. Really. So he is a leader um, and you would try to maybe answer these questions based on, based on um, the act that you, that you were listening about. So like, mm -hmm. um, so like, uh, so if you were doing act one, let's, how long does this video take? Let me see, two minutes. Okay, so what I would do is I would watch this video, it's three minutes, and then I would go back to that graphic organizer and I'd write down how George, not George, um, John yeah. Proctor is a leader, and then just save it. Just save that graphic organizer because you'll be working on it throughout the entire unit or be, be, um, throughout the entire semester. Does okay. that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know it's, it's hard. Um, this is hard because it's such a long play 
Um, also, typically the crucible is read, you know, within a, a classroom where you can ask questions to your teacher when you don't understand. Um, so it is challenging. However, I don't know if I'm your teacher. Am I your teacher or is it um, a different person? But um, if you have questions about like how to navigate something or like um, how to comprehend this or understanding anything, just shoot me an email or send me a chat too. Okay. Um, but specifically, like if you can't find a re, uh, if you can't answer, um, specifically if you can't answer these questions after, after, um, you know, learning about you, um, act one and act two, um, then, then ask me for help. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, and just know, like I said, this isn't in a, a graded assignment right now, but it will, I promise it will help you when you have to write your essay. Because otherwise at the end of the crucible, if you went through all the assignments at the end of the crucible, they're like, okay, and write a literary analysis essay. And you'd be like, what? Um, about what? So this will help you so that you'll have all those baby steps done.